<coughs> thank you, uh, Chris, and thank you to the group uh, for inviting me. Uh, that's a very kind uh, introduction, and uh, the point that Chris made about uh, trying to fit things together, I think, is um, relevant. Uh, that's what I've tried to do writing this book. Um, so I'm not an anthropologist. I'm a historian. Uh, I started writing about Russia and the Soviet Union. Um, I ended up in an institute for energy studies at the University of Oxford, which is where I work now. And uh, energy <coughs> studies, really, because <coughs> Russia has so much of the oil and gas, uh, particularly for supply to Europe. Uh, but working in that context uh, forced me, as I think it would anybody, uh, to think about some of the bigger issues. Um, and uh, to start with uh, the word that's in the title, unsustainable, um, what does that mean? Uh, what does sustainable mean? Uh, from, from some points of view, uh, fossil fuel production and consumption has been unsustainable for a very, very long time. Um, coal miners have been getting killed by their thousands uh, since the Industrial Revolution, digging up coal. And burning coal has always involved uh, millions of victims of disease or death uh, caused by air pollution. So these would be reasons to stop uh, coal production. But um, in other words, people who saw these as reasons to stop coal production thought that coal production was unsustainable. The people who made the decisions did not think that. Um, what I mean uh, particularly by the use of the word uh, unsustainable is that I think that the discovery of global warming uh, in the 1980s uh, by uh, climate scientists has raised the whole uh, unsustainability of uh, fossil fuel consumption to a whole uh, different level. It not only, uh, according to that science, um, produces air pollution or kills coal miners in the course of uh, production, but it threatens uh, a disastrous uh, continuation and acceleration uh, of global warming uh, with sea level rise, with uh, areas of agriculture being uh, ruined in uh, tropical parts of the world, uh, and those are just for starters. I think you're all familiar with probably uh, the sort of dangers that uh, global warming uh, can bring, uh, this sort of slow motion disaster which is unfolding now and will continue to unfold uh, through this century. And th th there's no doubt uh, that the uh, principal cause of uh, global warming is uh, fossil fuel consumption. So um, it's in that sense I mean that it's unsustainable. Of course, what's also happened since the 1980s is that the idea of sustainability has been folded into all sorts of uh, political narratives, um, or as an excellent uh, book that I'm very keen on, The Shock of the, Anthropoc the, Shock of the Anthropocene by uh, Bonoy and Fressos, two uh, French um, uh, social scientists. As they put it, uh, sustainability has been turned into a uh, column in the balance sheet, in, a, in the corporate balance sheet. Of course, we don't have to think of it like that. Uh, in order to accept that uh, there's only a limited amount of atmosphere that you can pump uh, carbon dioxide into uh, before it becomes a really big problem. Uh, so what I'm going to do, I've, uh, I, I held out for years, but I do these presentations with slides. That's the 21st century way. And I'm going to kind of whiz through some of these slides. So if you look at one and you want to ask more questions, let's do that in the... Uh, question time, and the way I'm going to do this is talk about, so the subject is, the subject of the book and the subject of the presentation is how has fossil fuel consumption increased uh, since the middle of the 20th century, because that's when the really big increase uh, has taken place, how has it, uh, and how has it continued to increase even after the dangers uh, that it brings in terms of uh, global warming uh, became generally recognized uh, 30 or so years ago. And my main point is to, that to get an answer to that question, we need to think of fossil fuels being consumed not 
uh, by individuals, uh, but by and through uh, technological, social and economic systems. And I'll explain what I mean by that. Um, I'll talk about those contexts. I'm going to talk very briefly about the numbers uh, because I think that's important. I think they can uh, throw light on things and they can uh, conceal things. And I'm going to go through the chronology, if you like, of that period since 1950. So, it, And it is a very big overview, uh, and deliberately so, um, because I think that's the only way of, of uh, getting to the heart of some of these questions. So the first uh, bunch of contexts are historical uh, contexts. Um, and the amount of fossil fuels that were consumed in the entire 19th century is about three years worth uh, in the way that they're getting consumed now. So while it's absolutely correct that um, fossil fuels being used on an industrial scale are, is something that began in the Industrial Revolution. So obviously people were using coal for thousands of years before that, but not in, a, in an organized industrial way. Um, so th that's one of the roots of this problem, but it's also true that this uh, graph uh, takes uh, some sharp leaps upward. The way it's drawn here, that doesn't look like a sharp leap around the end of the 19th century, but you could do the scales differently and it would look like a sharp leap. And what happened uh, towards the end of the 19th century is uh, what some people would call the second industrial revolution, electricity networks, steam turbines to drive those networks, um, the internal combustion engine, uh, which is in everybody's cars, uh, that stimulated uh, oil production are all uh, products of the late 19th and early 20th centuries. So there's the, a, a bunch of technological uh, changes that take place at that time, which some historians of technology call the second uh, industrial revolution and uh, the products and derivatives and successes of those products of that second industrial revolution still account for most of the uh, fossil fuel consumption in the world today. The other one worth mentioning is uh, chemical fertilizers which are, were basically a byproduct of um, the, product, uh, the production of poison gas during the uh, First World War. Um, and then you can see uh, the, the big uh, sharp increase upwards uh, after 1950. You may have heard of this idea of the Great Acceleration, um, which has been uh, coined by Earth system scientists who are looking at these big pictures. I think it, it's a very valid uh, concept for the late 20th century onwards. So uh, I'll try to pin down what happened that caused that huge uh, acceleration in terms of fossil fuel consumption. Just before we get onto that, uh, some other interesting things that I learned while I was doing this about the historical context. I always thought of the uh, dominance of the USA as being um, related to the rise of oil from uh, the middle of the 20th century onwards. What's really interesting is that uh, already towards the end of the 19th century, uh, so the USA is the North America, which includes a bit of Canada, uh, the North American coal uh, production and coal is pretty much getting consumed where it's produced at this time. North American coal production by 1913 is already uh, about as big as Western Europe and Britain uh, put together. So uh, if the Industrial Revolution started in Europe already by the end of the 19th century, uh, the USA is starting to overtake <laughs> in all sorts of ways. That's obviously bound up with that uh, second uh, industrial revolution. Um, the other thing to note before we get to uh, the 1950s is the importance of war. Uh, I've mentioned the First World War and the chemical fertilizers um, that arose as a byproduct. Uh, the Second World War just causes a huge bump up of infrastructure, oil-based infrastructure, transport infrastructure, uh, aviation infrastructure, uh, shipping fleets, 
uh, all these things massively expand at the expense of the large states uh, during the Second World War, and that then carries over into the post-war boom. Um, 1947, there's an international agreement made, a treaty signed, uh, that nobody will ever henceforth tax uh, aviation fuel. Um, that was a, uh, seen as a, a way of giving an impetus to the development of uh, air travel, and uh, that is in force today. Um, that's the historical uh, background. Um, okay, so I said that I look at this history in terms of systems, technological systems which are embedded in, situated in uh, social and uh, economic systems. So to try to uh, give you an example, this is a chart. I think, uh, Chris, we can circulate all these slides later, right? So y yeah, don't worry about picking up <coughs> the details and, and let's discuss them in the discussion period because some of them are very detailed. This one I took from a, uh, it's quite interesting to see how there are times when um, in the international agencies that churn out these documents and analyses, you get, a t you get some times when there are obviously some really good people working in there and they can't ever kind of give you the sort of analysis that you would expect to read in a, a, a really kind of critical uh, book of some kind, but they do get a lot of good stuff through. And such a report was the World Energy Assessment by the UN Development Program in 2000 for God knows who was responsible for it, but it got UN written on it. And uh, they produced a simplified version of this, which is pretty sort of standard for uh, people who are researching in energy. And it distinguishes between, so primary energy, if we go down here, primary energy is coal coming out of the ground and on the back of a truck. Um, Final energy, so then that goes into a power station. Uh, it is uh, burnt, and as we must never forget, uh, world average now, 53, 54% of that energy goes straight into the atmosphere for physical reasons. It's difficult for power stations to be much more uh, efficient than that. They've got some of them up to 55, 60% now, but most of them around 45%, and uh, uh, in many uh, cases, much lower than that. Uh, so then uh, the energy remains is in the form of electricity. So that's final energy. The electricity is coming out of the power station and um, let's, uh, yeah, that if you, if you kept going down that column, then the useful energy that might be produced by that electricity in an electric arc furnace in a steelworks, for example, would be heat to melt the uh, steel. Uh, result, what is it used for? Making steel. Or if you take that electricity to your house and turn the light on, what do you get? Light, and then you can see where you're going uh, after dark. So uh, the importance of this and uh, is that um, it highlights that, so when you read in your newspapers that we need so much uh, energy to keep the whole system going, um, that's nonsensical because uh, that statement doesn't take account of the fact that uh, that energy changes at each uh, stage of this process and what the environmentalists um, who suddenly found themselves getting funded in uh, Western universities after the 1970s when all the oil prices went up, what they insisted was that you have to start at the end. You have to ask, what is it you're trying to do? You're trying to make steel. You're trying to see where you're going after dark. And then work back from there uh, in order to work out the best way of producing that heat to uh, make the steel or producing that light to see where you're going in the dark. And in that way, uh, you can uh, get a truly efficient uh, system. And what this means to the historian like me, who comes along later, what this throws up is a very interesting phenomenon that all through this history since the 1950s, the engineers have been wise to the fact that the system is incredibly uh, wasteful in many respects. Uh, it's not 
it doesn't start at the end. It doesn't start by asking uh, what is the use of this energy that we're producing. Uh, though the decisions about what energy is produced and in what form are taken uh, on for other reasons. And here, so here's an example. In 1962, um, uh, these researchers looked at uh, cars in the United States, which has always been an outrageous example of egregious and wasteful uh, energy consumption. I'm talking about the car industry and the phenomenon of the car as a whole. This is not, there's a lot of places where you live in the States, you, if you haven't got a car, you can't get to the shops. And that's as a result of that system uh, being uh, built the way it has been built. And I'm not telling you anything new. Uh, these people were wise to this uh, in the 1960s. They worked out that the model changes. So if, if all the car producers just said, we'll just carry on producing the 1949 model, these model changes, um, which were predominantly to do with sales and marketing, cost $5 billion a year uh, and um, rising. And uh, they worked out that uh, actually two, um, the, 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 those of you who've read uh, Marxist economics will know Baron and Sweezy, one of the very classic works about American uh, capitalism in the 1960s. And they took this fi these figures and uh, came up with a huge number uh, for the proportion of GDP, uh, which was not for getting people from A to B, that's your useful energy, um, but for producing these cars and uh, the model changes, and it, it's a horrendous number. And like a lot of things in life, I can't remember what it is. So, uh, but it's there in Baron and Sweezy. Um, and so other examples, so uh, Amory Lovins, who was an environmentalist of the 70s, so you know, the oil prices go up, uh, the political and uh, business establishments suddenly realize that they've actually got a problem. Uh, the oil doesn't come free and it's not, um, it, it, there's not an infinite supply of it. And so suddenly uh, environmentalism kind of comes into the center stage in the political establishment. So Amory Lovins goes to the US Congress uh, in 1977. He says, using centralized electricity generation, so you know you heat this cold hundreds and hundreds of degrees, the heat goes out of the power station. Uh, that's the steam you see coming up out of the power station. Um, the, that produces electricity. You lose 10% on the way to wherever it's going. Uh, it goes to your home. Uh, and uh, you turn on the electric heater just to raise the temperature like five degrees or maybe 10 degrees. I mean, this is a fantastically insane way. If you start from the end, I'm trying to make my home a little bit warmer. This is a fantastically insane way of doing it. And it's come about as a result of the development of that centralized uh, electricity system, which can only be explained if you think about, I think, uh, that technological system and the way that it's situated in social uh, and economic uh, systems. So um, it, it was Im important to provide this wonderful form of energy, electricity, centralized and quickly, um, and with little thought about uh, how to do it efficiently. And these systems come into place uh, with a role being played. And it's very, I've spent a lot of time trying to disentangle uh, the different parts played by these different drivers with a role being played by the drivers of marketing and so on as with cars and with the whole workings of uh, capitalism. Um, and the last uh, quote on there is about, is not about past um, combinations of technology and social factors, but really about now. Um, and it's engineers saying uh, in a, 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 a assessment of energy problems that was commissioned by the uh, IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. What a supreme irony that computers, sensors, computational ability have transformed every major industry. We've all got phones in our pockets, um, except for power generation. So the potentials that computers give us for actually making that electricity system a lot more effective um, have not been uh, taken advantage of. And guess why? because the uh, companies who control that business make their money by selling electricity. So 
measures which uh, reduce the amount of electricity are measures that they have been treating very carefully and with great hesitation. Uh, they know they're coming and they're trying to manage that process in such a way as they continue to make money. Uh, that is their priority. Um, so th that's just my overview. When I say that technological systems are embedded in social and economic systems, my conclusion after reading all this stuff about the development of fossil fuel consumption uh, since uh, 1950 is that as the economy as a whole expands, fossil fuel consumption has expanded. And if you want to be specific about the routes that it has taken and the tracks it has gone down, uh, these are the main uh, processes that have uh, driven those numbers to increase. So industrialization, uh, changes in the labor process, uh, electrification, urbanization, uh, motorization, the, the spread of motor cars, and household material consumption and the consumerism uh, that goes with it. So I, I know they're generalities, that's on purpose. Um, so another context is that if the technological systems are embedded in uh, economic systems, um, those economic systems play a very big part in uh, determining how uh, the energy, be it electricity or energy in some other form, oil for your car, is uh, distributed, uh, how it's paid for. And the predominant uh, way is as a commodity. Um, oil <coughs> is a traded commodity, gas is a traded commodity, and there's been a battle really lasting since the 19th century over electricity and whether it should be uh, treated as a commodity, which neoliberalism says it should be, or whether it should be a state benefit, which uh, so in the 19th century, uh, the municipal socialists uh, believed that in order to provide a minimum standard of living to working class people in towns as they moved in from the countryside. You needed sewage, you needed clean water, um, you, sorry, you needed sewage systems, you needed clean water, and you needed increasingly electricity. And uh, in a lot of places, municipal socialism and all sorts of other uh, political uh, trends uh, in capitalism, uh, not only socialists were ready to see that as a necessary piece of infrastructure which the state uh, should provide. Uh, obviously with neoliberalism there's been a battle to push that back the other way and that battle has been waged most sharply in developing countries which have been going through electrification uh, during the period of neoliberalism, so I'm talking about you know from the 1980s until now, uh, huge areas of developing countries have been electrified and brought this wonderful form of energy to millions and millions of people and the battle really has been over uh, whether to pay for it uh, and, or whether it should be supplied by the state. And one very interesting phenomenon I've uh, come across during the research is really from Brazil to South Africa uh, to many, many other places, time and time again, uh, you get the phenomena, particularly in the 1990s, of um, poor people in towns in the developing world, they come into towns and they see electricity all around them, they expect to have it, and boy do they give a hard time to the companies who come around and ask for money for it. And uh, uh, schemes to steal the electricity, uh, being extremely developed in some uh, urban areas in, the, uh, in, in developing countries, uh, then the companies will then go in and say, okay, let's make a deal. Uh, we'll sell you it for less, um, bargaining by riot, um, as uh, historians of the, the from Europe in the 19th century coined that phrase. It, we see bargaining by riot in the 21st century. Probably the most political battle over this was in South Africa, um, where once the uh, ANC came into government 
and uh, towards the end of the 1990s then began to adopt all the sort of neoliberal formulas from the IMF and uh, the international agencies and the people in the townships who were very organized because they'd gone through the battle against uh, apartheid uh, didn't like the idea of uh, paying for electricity and there was a, a very long running conflict over that. So I'm saying it's important always to keep in mind uh, predominantly uh, energy in whatever form is treated as a commodity. Uh, it's also a state benefit. And then lastly, there's huge areas in developing countries which remain outside uh, the, that uh, commercial uh, energy system. So um, that's the world, that's Africa. Uh, the green bars are people without electricity. Um, generally, those without electricity, they may be, for example, buying uh, fuel wood, but it's more likely that they're sending usually the women from communities to go and collect that fuel wood, uh, sometimes many kilometers a day. Um, what the category of people that's really grown during the 2000s, that's those brown bars. They're people who've got some electricity, but still use biomass, so that's uh, brushwood or fuel wood from the countryside to cook. That's the world's population, right? And then in Africa, you can see that the people without electricity, it's still well over half of the uh, population. And just uh, very quickly and looking at the clock, uh, so uh, really inequality is in a way summed up by Nigeria, which still in 2011. So that's the energy that's actually used by people in Nigeria. Um, uh, and that's final use, so that's a bit technical, but the point is that everybody on either of those two columns is using green, which is uh, hydro and other renewables, which in this case means biomass from the countryside, fuel wood, women walking miles a day to pick up wood and bring it back to use for cooking. Uh, that's the amount, so this is all measured by energy rather than by money. Um, that's the oil that's exported from Nigeria, the big black bit and that's the oil that's used in Nigeria. So uh, you can see how the inequality works there. And that's 2011 and not much would have changed even if we had more recent figures. Okay, I'm looking at the clock, I'm moving on. Um, numbers, I'll say this very quickly. So that's an overview. Uh, and this is the kind of key point to me. There's, the, there's where even the Saudi Arabian politicians who uh, attended the 1991 Earth Summit in Rio, along with all the other politicians, acknowledged that global warming was a really, really, really serious problem. And there's the result of the international negotiations subsequently. So just a couple of things about numbers. Uh, is rising population really the main driver of energy use? If you read the IPCC reports and you read the beginning bit, which is the only bit that any politician reads and most journalists and uh, most of the rest of us, it says that population and uh, economic expansion are the two main drivers of um, increased consumption of fossil fuels. Uh, as a country I know a bit more about, Russia, and I've chosen it because the population is actually slowly going downwards, unlike most countries. Does that make any difference to uh, the level of fossil fuel consumption? None whatsoever. Uh, the level of fossil fuel consumption went very sharply downwards in the uh, 1990s when Russia suffered the biggest uh, slump of any country in peacetime and then sort of went up a bit and went down again as a result of the uh, 2008 financial crisis and then kind of went up a bit. But it's, it, there's no correlation there whatsoever. Uh, and uh, there's no correlation there either. China is on the left. Uh, so there's population. Uh, is population what caused that? No, it isn't. That's the industrial boom of China becoming the workshop of the world from the mid-2000s onwards. Uh, and that's the USA. Not a lot of correlation there either. Um, it started to come down because of the energy efficiency measures that are finally feeding through in some of the rich countries. Um, but there just isn't correlation. If you took those diagrams and put uh, economic growth on them, you'd see that that was much more closely correlated with the uh, growth of uh, fossil fuel consumption. So 
there's almost no correlation with population. That doesn't mean population is completely irrelevant. There are obviously all sorts of connections between uh, population growth and uh, fossil fuel consumption. My point really is they're not simple and they're not immediate because people consume uh, the fossil fuels through these systems and very often the people sitting at the end of those systems and consuming have no control over how the whole uh, system works. Um, energy use per head figures, uh, they're useful, uh, very useful to the developing countries in the climate negotiations. There's Bangladesh, there's the USA. Uh, that, that's in everything, of course. It's not just fossil fuel consumption. But even these figures don't tell you the whole story. That's Germany, that's Russia. Does that mean that uh, Russian people have started consuming more fossil fuels uh, than German people? Of course not, because Russian people are usually much poorer. What it means is they live in a very large and very cold country, and those technological systems that uh, use those fossil fuels are, in Russia's case, very old and not working as well as the German ones. Uh, that's the basic reason why that brown line, uh, Russian line, is actually higher uh, than uh, the German line. So what's coming into German families at the end in terms of electricity and other types of fuel uh, is probably uh, much more and being used in a much more useful way than is coming to uh, Russian families. Let me go back to those later. Uh, those are the numbers which the carbon budgets uh, which tell us that, as I mentioned, three years emissions in the 2010s is like all emissions in the 19th century. Crucial point at the very end, at the current rate, this budget. So these budgets are set, they are not set by fishing communities in Bangladesh who probably think this fossil fuel thing has gone far enough already. They're set in the uh, international climate talks and obviously uh, there's a huge argument about all these numbers, but anyway, they're the ones I'm using on this particular slide, uh, which doesn't mean they're perfect, it means they're the numbers that they're using. Um, the budget will be used up. That's the whole budget for all use of fossil fuels ever um, between the mid-2020s or the late 2030s at the rate we're going. Um, so that's that. Right. Can you just explain that last point? Because you just said that the budget should last for the whole of the next few centuries. And, well, it's be, and it's going to be used up by the 2020s to the 2030s. The budget has been worked out by uh, climate scientists and other people who work with them and they do a thing every year so that you can you know you can get that off the internet global carbon budget just google it um, there's, there's a lot of research they've been doing it for many years and they work it out on the basis of uh, having a 66 percent chance of getting to a certain temperature now as I said if we were in a Bangladeshi fishing community we probably would say enough already but by the end of the century no no no, no. no just at all so to have a 66 percent chance of sticking chance of sticking to 1.5 <coughs> degrees more than the temperature was before the Industrial Revolution. Uh, we need to or, or we need to stop using the budget in the mid-2020s if we keep using the budget at the rate we're using it now. If we slow down, we got a bit longer. Uh, or if we think that 2 degrees is okay, uh, and the 2 degrees is what the IPCC thinks is okay, uh, there are a lot of climate scientists who don't agree, they think it's 1.5 degrees. But if the IPCC is right, uh, it's a 66% uh, chance of sticking to two degrees by the late 2030s if we keep using the fuels at the rate we're using them. And then uh, we would need to stop completely. Uh, but it won't happen like that, of course. Um, OK, uh, moving on. So I mean, I've spent a, a bit of time, more than probably I should have done, on the context because I thought there's not a lot of point in going through the chronology without having a way of looking at this. So actually I, I, I spent a lot of my research time trying to work out how to look at it before actually researching the facts which are, which are not so hard to get hold of. There's lots of them. Um, and so what I'll do, I'll just whiz through these time periods um, and s talk about and uh, in an audience like this, there will be lots of people who've, who've looked at kind of bits of this. So I'm not saying these are the only things that happened. I'm saying these are the things that struck me as being really important. Um, the 1950s, 
again, I can't remember the number, but most fossil fuels in the world are being consumed in one country, the USA. Uh, it has leapt forward in terms of uh, the systems of uh, electricity systems, of car-based, the history of car-based urban transport starts in the USA uh, in the 1920s. Uh, the car companies enter into what you could only call a conspiracy, and in fact a judge in Chicago did call it that, with some of the transport companies to drive the electric trams off the street. They wanted to gash through, as one of their lobbyists said in the 1940s, gash through the cities with, with freeways and make sure that everybody had a car, and they were very successful. And that's a big item. Um, two other things to talk about. Uh, with respect to the, and the post-war boom, people in Europe start to get cars. They definitely didn't have them in any great numbers before that, S slightly in the UK. But uh, in Spain in the 1950s, I think it was uh, about a quarter of a million people per car. Um, so two, two things I'll focus on. I've talked about roads. The other one is, is households. Um, this is the, these are the decades when uh, gas cookers, electric irons, sewing machines, radios, vacuum cleaners and washing machines become widespread not only in the USA but in other rich countries. And what that does is to completely change people's lives and in particular to change uh, the way that work is done in the home. And these appliances enable uh, energy to substitute for labor. Uh, washing machines and vacuum cleaners, for example, ease some of the most backbreaking household tasks. But as with all technologies, the changes are never unilateral and never uh, straightforward. There's been a massive research uh, done on this um, by, uh, there's a fantastic uh, feminist historian of uh, technology, uh, Rose Schwartz Cowan, uh, who, who wrote about this more work for mother. Um, and there's been a lot of kind of number crunching uh, research done subsequently. And what the number crunching shows is that the, the most backbreaking tasks uh, have in the rich countries been removed from uh, domestic labor, which is mostly done uh, by women. Um, the, um, but the amount of hours that are spent on domestic labor has hardly changed. Now, in some respects, there's some good news there that the sort of things that my daughter does uh, in, in domestic labor. She spends a lot of time uh, with her children, much more so than previous, uh, her generation than previous generations. But the time never goes down. Uh, the time spent on domestic labor never goes down. Part of the problem is the men don't usually uh, do much more. That's a, a very widespread uh, phenomenon in all the rich countries. Um, and of course, that also reflects the situation industry. When we come on to the 1980s, we can talk about technology and industry, there's a big technological shift in industry in the rich countries, and uh, the number of hours of labor doesn't go down there either. So something else is going on um, with respect to the amount of uh, time people spend at work. Um, 1970s, uh, the energy crisis is a meaningless term. There were two big oil price shocks. Uh, 1973, 1979. This was because of a redivision of the spoils between the international oil companies and the countries uh, where the, most of the oil was produced, to say it in a very short way. Um, a real, there was a real crisis for developing countries that relied on imported oil, and basically they all borrowed tens and hundreds of uh, billions of dollars uh, from the international uh, agencies or from the markets in order to pay for that oil, thus giving rise to or, or feeding into the debt crisis of the 80s. Um, there was an oil price adjustment for rich nations. And um, I mean one of the things about, again, about the car and about fossil fuel systems as culture uh, is amazing to see the extent to which uh, American politicians in particular went to protect car drivers from the effect of the uh, oil price shock. Um, which over, you know, during the period of the 1980s w was, was almost no effect on the average American car driver. And that's to do, with, of course, with the way that American society works and the relationship between the American political elite and the population. 
There was also a crisis of perception and policy. And political elites and uh, public opinion, whatever that is in the rich countries, wakes up to the fact that, uh, as I said before, the energy is not inexhaustible and it's not cheap. And that does result uh, in serious research being done on energy efficiency and uh, environmentalism comes into the political mainstream uh, for the first time. The 1980s So in the 1980s, the, most of the consumption is still in the global north. The OECD countries, that's the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the rich countries, to say it in a short way, uh, less than a quarter of the world population accounted for 62% of fossil fuel consumption in 1980. That fell a little bit by the turn of the century, but not much. Um, they're consumption of fossil fuels didn't go up as quickly as it had before. Their consumption of oil did actually go down, but mainly because they found ways of using coal or gas uh, when the oil got particularly expensive, especially coal. Um, the economies in the rich countries became more energy efficient. They used less energy per unit of economic output, but that was mainly because your energy intensive Materials production, producing steel, aluminium, cement, plastics, uh, went off to the global south. Not entirely, but um, in very large uh, quantities. I think the other thing, again, we're talking about overviews that changed in the 1980s was the nature of work and the nature of personal consumption. Sustained attack on wages and unions in the 1980s in the rich countries, but generally wage levels rose a little. That was partly because people work longer hours. And then you, in the terms of personal consumption, you get a whole lot of other things which also help to push up uh, fossil fuel consumption. Freezers, dishwashers, microwaves. Uh, my parents' generation never heard of any of those. Um, and the constantly rising use of cars. And really, the, the sociologists who've gone into this in huge amounts of detail, they pinpoint the 1980s as the start of the so-called throwaway culture when it's cheaper to buy a new one than uh, to fix the old one. Um, the other thing that happens in the 1980s is that the scientists uh, really reach a consensus. They've been moving towards uh, an understanding of global warming then as a process and the role of uh, fossil fuel consumption in causing it. And they kind of get to a consensus in the mid to late uh, 1980s. OK. I've got a lot of in the book about electrification. It's incredibly important. If anybody wants to know about that, ask a <coughs> question. And I'll get more time in the question time to talk about it. Um, so after that uh, discovery of global warming, we get to the Rio conference in the 1990s. The priority for the most powerful negotiator, which is the US, is to avoid any binding uh, targets for reducing emissions, <laughs> and their, their delegation turns up very organized. Uh, the Soviet delegation, obviously, in some amount of chaos at this point, 1991, just before the uh, end of the Soviet Union, and the American delegation gets what it wants. That's carried over into the 1997 uh, Kyoto Treaty. There are voluntary targets, and crucially, they're to be achieved through market mechanisms. Uh, you can't tell any company to change its behavior. It's all got to be done by pricing. Um, I remember going to a seminar in Oxford once, and I'm not supposed to tell you who the speaker was. Indeed, I'm not sure I can remember, but it was a big sort of expert person on uh, oil prices and so on. He said, we want to make an effect with uh, carbon pricing. Give me $200 for a ton of carbon. And uh, if there's anyone here who follows these things, they'll be more up to date than me. But the price on the European uh, emissions trading system, which is regarded as the most effective one, is somewhere kind of around five or ten euros at the moment. Um, so it's not working. Um, and uh, it's very easy to get angry at uh, climate science deniers. And in this period, of course, they're being financed by big oil. That, that uh, stops subsequent, subsequently, but we've seen the 
uh, fruits of their uh, labor in uh, the White House this year and last year. Uh, that's kind of fed through in a, in a political sense. But the, the big oil backs away from climate science denial. It, it's too crude. Uh, it's too obviously uh, false uh, by the end of the 1990s. But the predominant political view in Europe and with the US Democrats was that the science was right, but it has to be addressed through these market mechanisms. And I think that view has been far more influential uh, in the process uh, than uh, climate science denial. And I think that's the view we need to see as the dominant one. Um, this is the view from uh, India. Um, the uh, governments and uh, NGOs from the developing countries uh, fought a battle against the uh, use of um, uh, environmentalism in, in uh, quotation marks to reinforce uh, <coughs> inequalities. And uh, it's a rather nice, a nice cartoon um, that I found in the course of my research. Okay, 2000s, so those policies really failed and were always, and, and never worked, were always failing. And in the 2000s, there's another sharp ramp up of uh, consumption, uh, mainly due to the, um, the industrial boom in China. Uh, China is a really crucial factor. That's that red line there. So overtaking uh, the US as, as the biggest uh, consumer. Um, China has electrified the countryside almost completely. There's no country in the world that's ever, not even the USA, has ever electrified the countryside with private money. It's done by the state. The Chinese state, uh, more effective than some others, for example, the Indian state, which has uh, still hundreds of millions of people have no uh, electricity access in India, but in China, essentially that problem is uh, solved. Electrification has been done, uh, but that's not where the big uh, amounts of fossil fuel are used. The big amounts are used in industry and the towns. So, um, fossil fuels consumption has expanded much more rapidly than before and in a qualitatively different way. And, and as I say, I think this feeds into this conception of a great acceleration. Um, which has come from the Earth system scientists. Fossil fuels are consumed through these systems. Interpretive frameworks that isolate consumption from these systems or isolate consumption from production are misleading. Individuals consume in the context of these systems. So discretionary and non-discretionary consumption need to be distinguished from each other. So if I go out and leave the light on in my house, that's my choice to be an idiot and leave the light on. But it's not my choice that 10% of the electricity has disappeared on it way to my house, that the street is lit up on as I uh, walk through the street, uh, that uh, electricity is being used in industry in all sorts of ways over which I have absolutely no control. So there's discretionary and non-discretionary, and we need to separate them. Economic expansion has driven consumption through the trends that I mentioned, the industrialization, the urbanization, <coughs> and so on. Uh, fossil fuel intensive forms of production consumption have been embedded in the economy from the late 19th century and expanded rapidly in the uh, post-war boom. Um, the discovery of global warming provided an imperative for transition away from fossil fuel-based energy systems, and it hasn't happened. Transition away from those systems is not a technological issue only. Um, Energy-intensive technologies are, have been privileged over less energy-intensive ones and fossil fuels over renewables, for example, for social, political, and economic reasons. Uh, technologies has, have to be diffused. Um, so you, you, know, you can open The Guardian and read about how fantastic it is that uh, the, the um, amount of renewables generated has gone up by X percent, but you know, really it's gone up, if, if that's the story, from you know, very small to not quite so small. Uh, of course, uh, there's been a huge increase in investment in renewables. That is now happening, uh, and uh, electric cars too. But there are a lot of ideologized claims around that there's a breakthrough on the way, and uh, the figures just don't uh, bear that out. 
Technological potentials have long been known for reducing consumption and the obstructions are primarily social, political and economic. Um, the process that has uh, been in train since Rio has made no progress in reducing uh, fossil fuel consumption, this political, this intergovernmental process, uh, something I haven't mentioned, a huge area of research that's developed since that time is uh, subsidies to uh, fossil fuels, which uh, th there are now very good ways of measuring them. The people in the voluntary sector and academia who spent a lot of time and energy working it out, and it's hundreds of billions of dollars. And the subsidies to renewables that you can read about in the newspapers have never come anywhere near to the level of subsidies uh, to fossil fuels. If you want to know how hard the governments are trying, uh, read up on the subsidies. Um, <coughs> proposals for using market mechanisms have failed. Um, what progress is made where you do see a fall in, uh, in fossil fuel use or an increase in efficiency, it's because a government somewhere has done something. And I don't have any easy answers as to how uh, that change is going to happen. Um, but I would say that uh, radical technological change is most likely to happen in the course of radical social and economic change, which is something I would hope would happen anyway. And I'll stop there.